Hi, hi. Hello. My name is Ingrid Herberg and I teach Norwegian and Scandinavian studies here at Augustana. So my students learn not only about Norway, but also about its Scandinavian neighbors, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Iceland, which is out in the Atlantic. The most popular class I teach is Viking Age mythology. And when my students arrive, many of them are, are very familiar with the Marvel Universe, with the Marvel films about Thor and Odin and Loki, the graphic novels and comic books. They quickly discover that the Old Norse mythology universe is much bigger than that, and also that it's quite different at times. So today I'd like to talk to you about, uh, tell you a little bit about the Old Norse gods. You'll be familiar with some of them, but I bet you'll learn something new as well. I'm going to show you some slides. So I'm going to not disappear, but I'll be smaller up in the corner and then you can take a look at the pictures that I show you. Here we go. So the Vikings are, though they lived a thousand, a thousand years ago, they're very popular today. And there are actually many sports teams called the Vikings, including the Augustana Vikings. Why? Because the Vikings were known to be fierce competitors, brave in battle, and, and we can understand why sports teams like that name. In Alberta, there are actually a group of people who are very fascinated by the Vikings, and they're called Odin's Ravens. They're men, women, and children that dress up like Vikings, and they're very knowledgeable, very authentic clothing. They uh, put up villages at certain uh, events. And you can visit those villages and you can watch them perform mock battles. Uh, you can even participate at times and you can watch them make things, cook Viking food and so on. So if you ever have a chance uh, to see Odin's Ravens in Alberta, I would recommend it. So the Vikings were able to uh, get around and be the, the very efficient raiders, but also traders and settlers that they were uh, by the use of their long boats or their ships. And you can, if you visit Norway or Denmark today, you can still see these ships in museums. So people are, are today very fascinated with the Vikings. And part of that is fascination with their literature, their stories, Keep in mind that the Vikings did raid and they were violent people. They were a violent people in a violent time, but they were much more than raiders. They were also, as I said, traders. They settled um, other areas and they also had very sophisticated art and literature. And the stories that they told were not written, but they were passed down orally from generation to generation. So the Vikings had very good memories. And the mythology, uh, the, the myths that I'm going to tell you today and the information that I'm going to give you comes from two uh, sources called the Prose Edda and the Poetic Edda. Uh, and these are collections of stories that were originally passed down orally and now we have them in written form. So in uh, the Old Norse worldview and in their mythology, uh, there are tales about, myths about how the world started and how it ends. The Vikings, like people today, were very interested in where they came from, but also in how things were potentially going to end. And maybe you've heard of Ragnarok, that's the um, destruction of everything at the end of times. Uh, and you pro though you probably haven't heard uh, about the creation myths, um, I don't think those are covered in the Marvel Universe. At any rate, there are many stories about major world events in mythology, including the beginning of time and the end of times. The Vikings believed in more than one god. They had many gods. They also believed in many realms. Yggdrasil was the world tree that held the different worlds together. And the three that I'll be talking about today are Jutnheim, which is the realm of the giants, and they were the enemies of gods and people. And the gods lived in Osgard, and people lived in Midgard. Although the gods did travel to Jutnheim at times, and also down to visit people in Midgard, although that wasn't as common. The head god, the head of the pantheon was Odin. He 
was known for his wisdom and he was so committed to becoming wiser that he actually gave up an eye to become wiser. So he was also the one I got. He often disguised himself and traveled around. He was a wanderer or presented himself as a wanderer with one eye. And the picture on the left there, you see him uh, as the wanderer. Though people respected him, they were very fearful of him. And, and it's often said you wouldn't want to meet Odin on a dark night because he, he wasn't necessarily the kindest guy around. In the middle there, you see uh, a, a depiction of Odin with the one eye, but also with two ravens. Ravens are very smart birds, and they were Odin's birds. He sent them out into the world every day, these two ravens, Hugin and Mugin, thought and memory. They collected information and brought it back and whispered it into Odin's ear. Odin also had his enemies, uh, and his biggest enemy was the Fenrir wolf, which was actually a child of Loki, the trickster. And at the end of time, the Fenrir wolf comes back, it, it's been chained and it gets out of its chains and actually fights Odin and Odin loses that battle. So the gods were destructible. They could die in, in Old Norse uh, thinking. Odin also had an eight-legged horse, that's fantastical, called Schleipnir. Frigg was Odin's wife. Unlike the Marvel Universe, where she's quite talkative and we hear a lot from her, we don't hear much from her in the original Old Norse myths. But she is there, she's an authority figure, and she clearly is a powerful woman. There's also Thor. He actually wasn't Frigg's son. She was just his stepmother. His mother was Earth and Odin was his father. And Thor was known, of course, for his big hammer. And I have one here. This is Thor's hammer. And when he struck his hammer, you could hear the thunder in the sky. And Thursday is Torstad in uh, Norwegian for, and in Scandinavian languages, which means Thor's day. So there's a day of the week named after him. He was very, very popular. Uh, unlike Odin, who was respected and feared, uh, he, he, Odin wasn't the most popular god, but Thor was. People could identify with him because he did make mistakes now and then, just like people do. And uh, Odin was known for his temper, but also using this hammer to protect people and gods against the giants. And on the right here, you see him uh, trying to kill the Midgard serpent, which was another child of Loki was very dangerous to humans. He was out in the ocean and so big that he could be wrapped around the earth and his tail could fit into his mouth. It's that big. And on the left, you see Thor in his chariot drawn by two goats. Lots of people are named after Thor, even today, and lots of places are named after Thor, or Tuid, as we say in Norwegian. Sif was his wife and she was known for her beautiful, long, golden hair. Heimdall is another figure that we find in Marvel. He was the watchman or the guardsman of the of the gods. He stood at the end of the rainbow Bifrost, which uh, was between Oscar, the realm of the gods, and Midgard, the realm of the people, and he would sound his trumpet when danger approached. And, and we, we know this because at the end of the world, uh, the end of times, he blew his horn when he saw that very bad things were happening. Loki, You've all probably heard of Loki the trickster. He could be helpful to the gods at times, but he was often very destructive. And he loved to shapeshift. Sometimes he appeared as a bear, sometimes as a salmon or a fly, even a falcon. And in the story I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, he disguises himself as a woman. Loki had three, well, he had more than three children, but three of his children are very well known and were very, very dangerous. One was the Midgard Serpent. Another was uh, a woman named Hel, H-E-L, who reigned over the realm of the dead. And the other was the Fenrir Wolf. And I told you that the Fenrir Wolf killed Odin at the end of times. And the Midgard Serpent actually poisoned Thor at the end of times. So very dangerous beings. Some of the gods and goddesses you may not have heard about yet uh, are, are, are Eden and Bragi, Ul and Skadi. So let me tell you a bit about them now. Here you have Eden, 
And Eden was a goddess, and she was very important because she was the keeper of the apples. And the apples represented eternal youth. As long as the gods ate these apples, they remained young. And of course, that sort of warded off the end of times. But also, the gods, and they were just a reflection. They just showed what the Vikings, uh, what, what they thought uh, in the Vikings. And of course, people today were all, we often think about aging and how to maybe prevent aging or not to age as rapidly. So by eating these apples, the gods remained young. And up here you see Loki trying to get Eden uh, to give him some apples. And the story of Eden and her apples is one of the myths that we don't have time to talk about today, but perhaps you can read it on your own. Eden was married to Bragi, and Bragi was the god of poetry and music. Now you might say the Vikings had a god of poetry. They were warriors, weren't they? But the Vikings really valued poetry. Keep in mind, poetry is how Viking Age people were able to pass down their myths, things from their history, and poetry was quite challenging to compose, at least skaldic poetry. So it took a really smart person and a really uh, trained person to compose poetry. So there were, uh, there were actually warrior poets and they were like rock stars. And, and for example, Odin, he was a warrior, but he also was connected to poetry. And, and Bragi was then a special god for poetry. So uh, today we have our hockey stars and other sports stars and rock stars of musical groups, but poets were a kind of rock star of the Viking Age. So Bragi and Eden are perhaps two gods you hadn't heard of before, but they show us, uh, Eden shows us something that, that by, that people were thinking about, and that is aging or the approach of the end of times. And Bragi uh, reveals that people were interested in poetry in the age of the Vikings. There's also the god Tyr, who was the god um, of war, and he was very brave. I've mentioned to you Fenrir, this wolf, that was a, a child of Loki, and as he grew, he became very, very strong, and he posed a great threat to the gods. And they decided they needed to chain him, but Fenrir was smart, and he said, you can't get near me with a chain unless one of you puts their hand in my mouth. And I know then that you won't harm me because I'll take your hand off. This was a problem, but Tyr was so brave, he said, I will put my hand in his mouth, knowing he would lose it. So Tyr put his hand in the wolf's mouth, the gods chained him, Tyr lost his hand, but the gods were safe for a long, long time to come. And you'll notice in all of these depictions of Tyr, he only has one hand. The final two gods I want to tell you about are Skadi, who was the goddess of skiing, and Ul, who was also a god of skiing. So let's start with Skadi. Here you see her, she was a very strong woman, strong goddess. She was associated with skis and the winter, and of course, uh, there's a lot of snow in Scandinavia, and we can identify with that in Canada. We have lots of snow too. Here she has a bow, and it is in the mountains. So she was in the mountains, she liked to hunt, use her bow, and ski. Well, what's interesting about Scotty is she ended up marrying, and she was actually a giantess that married a god, and she was considered to be a goddess. So she married Njord, who was the god of sea and wind. And they had a very unhappy marriage because Njord could not stand being in the mountains, and Scotty could not stand being by the sea. So as they commuted from one home to another, uh, one of them was always unhappy. Some people have said, why didn't Scotty just marry Ul? And Ul was actually, uh, as I said, a god associated with skiing and hunting as well. But they didn't marry. There are lots of things we don't understand about the mythology. Uh, one thing that, that uh, Scott, uh, rather Ul is sometimes linked to our shields. He was, uh, a shield is called Ul's, um, let me take a look here, Ul's ship. So it, some people speculate, John Lindau being one of them, he studied a lot about the Old Norse myths, is that perhaps Ul was like the first 
a snowboard or maybe he took his shield and stood on it and was transported that way it was like a ship so maybe he was actually like the first snowboarder we don't really know but you get a sense that there were lots of gods and goddesses i don't have time to talk about any more today but some of them are better known some of them lesser known and it's quite fascinating it covers all parts of life these gods and goddesses they represent people's interests and their desires and sometimes their fears and here are just a couple more pictures of Ul. And you see he also was associated with skates. So finally today, I want to tell you a myth, a story. And it is actually about the theft of Thor's hammer. And keep in mind that Thor's hammer was very important to keep people safe and the gods safe from the giants. And in the story, you'll hear about Thor, also a bit about Loki, Freya, and Heimdall. And then there's a giant named Thrym. And Freya was the goddess of love and fertility, and she had these two cats that you see in the bottom of this picture. Keep in mind that the pictures I've been showing you have come from many different eras and times. There are different ways in which people have imagined the gods. Uh, we don't have uh, many illustrations from the era. We have some etchings on rune stones and things, but basically all of our pictures come from later years. People have read the stories that were written down after many hundreds of years, and then they have these images in their mind. So that's what I've been showing. you. So let's hear a story. One morning, Thor woke up, Tuid, I'll call him Tuid for the story, Tuid woke up and he looked for his hammer as usual, maybe he kept it under his pillow, and he realized it wasn't there. And this caused him to panic. It was really important to have this hammer. So he called out to Loki, Loki, can you help me locate my hammer? But Loki couldn't help him find the hammer, but he offered to go and try to find it elsewhere. He said, I think the giants might have stolen it. In order to get to Jutenheim, in the home of the giants, it was a long, long way. He had to figure out how to get there. So he went to Freya, the goddess of love, and he said, Freya, can I borrow your wings? Because she had some falcon wings. He borrowed, and she said, of course, this is really important. So he borrowed them, flew away to Jutenheim, and there he saw the giant Trim. And Trim looked rather happy and pleased with himself. And Loki said, have you seen Thor's hammer? And Loki said, or rather, Tim said, yes, I have it, and I buried it far beneath the earth, and you won't get it back until Freya marries me. Ooh, this was a big, this was a, a big request. So Loki flew back to uh, Oscar. He met up with the gods, and he said, Freya has to get married to Tim, otherwise Tuid won't get his hammer back. But Freya would have none of that. She stamped her foot and she said, no way. But Heimdall had a really good idea. He said, Tuid, you just have to dress up like Freya. You can trick those giants. And when you get in there, you can dispose of the giants. Tuid did not want to do this because he was a macho guy and he didn't want to dress up like a woman. But, every, but the other gods convinced him to do so. And Loki agreed to be his his handmaid, his, his helper, and uh, he, he didn't mind dressing up like a woman. So off they went, and they got to Trim's hall. Tuid was all dressed up like a bride, and Trim was very, very happy. And he said, although he was a little surprised at how big the bride was, and he said, let's sit down and eat. I've prepared this fabulous feast. So they sat down, and Trim was shocked at how much the bride could eat. She ate eight salmon and a whole ox right away. And he said, I've never seen a, a woman eat like that. But Loki said, she's been yearning for you for many nights. So as a result, uh, you know, she hasn't been able to eat. That's why, oh, he accepted that. Then he said, I think I'm gonna kiss my, my bride-to-be. And he pulled her veil back across her face and was shocked by the eyes. They were like thunderbolts and the giant had to step back and he said i've never seen such such eyes on a woman or a man or anybody and loki said well that's just because she's been she hasn't been able to sleep because she's so excited about marrying you so trim said i think it's time we get married then 
bring me the hammer. And in the age of the Vikings, it was part of a wedding ceremony, a marriage ceremony, that the hammer was presented to the bride and she put it, her, set it on her lap. And then uh, the, that, that was just what they did. So Trim kept his end of the bargain, brought out the hammer, and then Tuud revealed who he really was. And he took off the veil and he said, I'm Tuud, the god of thunder, and I'm going to do away with all of you. And he proceeded to use his hammer and he got rid of Trim and all of the other giants and went home to Ostard and the gods celebrated. So there you have just one myth from Old Norse mythology. And I hope that you've learned something today. You've probably heard some things you knew from before, but hopefully some new things as well. So tak for no, thanks for now. And as they say in Norwegian, ha de bra, bye.